Um, Nicole DeBoom is here and she'll be joining us. Nicole is from Chicago originally and she um, attended Yale University as a swimmer where she then went on to qualify for the 1988 Olympics. Um, Nicole has worked as a professional triathlete for over 10 years before she finally, um, as well as winning uh, Ironman, a, a few Ironmans, and she is now the CEO of Skirt Sports, which she founded herself while running and in some of her husband's old running clothes and realized that she did not look beautiful wearing her husband's clothing. So this was her inspiration to start her business, Skirt Sports, and she has just changed the industry for women's athletic wear across the country. So with that, we would just like to give a warm welcome to Nicole DeBoom. All right, can you guys hear me? Is this cool? I had to do the dramatic entrance. Still running at 43 years old. So cool. Um, thank you for having me. Okay, wait, I have to get a photo. I'm learning how to selfie. I'm old. Okay, you guys, give a big wave. Okay. Cool. Oh, look, I, I think I got it. Woo! Done. You're in. I saw it. Okay. Um, so today... I am going to talk to you about my background and my story from pro triathlete to entrepreneur. Are you ready? Yes. Thank you. It worked. All right. So we're going to start with my story and my background. And then I'm going to get into some cool business stuff and some lessons learned along the way. And write down any questions you have because I'm totally open book. They can be personal. They can be business, whatever. All right. So we can get down and dirty today. So I'm from Chicago. Anybody else? Anyone not from Utah? Oh, you are. We're going to hang out afterwards. OK. I, most of you are from Utah, but I saw some non-Utah hands come up. Um, I grew up in the Chicago suburbs. And any of you who are from the Midwest know that it's very boring. But then I talk to people from anywhere, and they all say you, everyone was bored everywhere in high school. And um, you know what I did during those times was I got into sports. My parents threw me into sports at, at a very young age. I grew up actually running. That's me in sixth grade looking cool, wearing awesome socks. These eventually became known as compression socks. But in sixth grade, they were tube socks. We would actually roll them down and make little donuts around your ankle. Anyway, I was a really fast runner as a kid. Um, in eighth grade, I ran a 525 mile. I was kind of like pretty talented, right? Um, it's funny. I remember the high school cross country coach coming out and saying, we want you to run cross country and do track at high school. And I said, well, that's great. But you know what? I'm a pretty good runner, but I really love swimming. So here's the thing. Obviously, I had some genetics. I often talk about the trifecta in sports. And you can take this into business and whatever. I think that in order to be very successful, you need three things. You need some kind of genetic gift. Um, that's just a natural ability to do whatever it is you're doing. You need a hard work ethic. That's something that generally people learn by example. Oops, go back. And you need mental toughness. That is probably the thing that most people lack. They may grow up. Great genetics, they may have a great work ethic, but when things get hard, they don't rise to the occasion. I think in the end, I had all three things. I was lucky to have all three things. Swimming became what I truly loved. Um, in my intro, she said I qualified for the 1988 Olympics. I actually qualified for the Olympic trials. I wasn't as good as the Olympic caliber, but at age 16 in 1988, I was the fifth ranked 100 breaststroker in the country. That means that I was recruited to colleges. It was OK that I didn't run in high school, because swimming really elevated me and gave me a lot of opportunities. And uh, I chose Yale University, which is an awesome school, right? You've heard of it, right? It's on the East Coast somewhere. Um, and I was a swimmer at Yale. People go, what'd you major in? I was like, well, I got my degree in sociology, but really, I was a swimmer. And I drank a lot of beer. Do you see that? <laughs> Puffy, kind of a little extra layer, but really tan, having fun. 
that was our training trip to Puerto Rico. You see, sports take you places, right? Um, I also dated one of those, actually hooked up with most of those guys. Um, <laughs> one of them became my boyfriend for a while, but anyway. Um, so, after college, <clears throat> I didn't know what I was going to do. How many of you know what you're going to do for the rest of your life? Actually, no one. Usually one person is like, I will be a ER nurse for children or, you know, something. Um, I didn't know either. I had no idea. And um, I went home to Chicago and started waiting tables and did a process I call soul searching. So I kind of dug in and I said, okay, well, in order to figure out what I want to do next, I kind of have to figure out what makes me tick. I didn't realize then, but I was doing my first sort of core value exercise in my life. When you're starting a business, it's one of the things we'll talk about later, but core values become really important. Because if you don't know who you are, how can you keep going forward? So I thought about it, and this little mantra bubbled to the surface. And this is a really important one for me, and it still is today. When my body is fit and strong, my mind is fitter and stronger too. Simple. But what it told me was that, hey, you're not good enough to be a professional swimmer. You may be able to be a professional something else down the road. But, oh god, why is this going forward? You guys got a sneak peek of something really cool there. Um, but I knew that whatever I was going to do was going to involve fitness. And it may not be a professional career in fitness, but my job needed to give me the opportunity to include fitness in my life. So, like I said, I was waiting tables. But while I was waiting tables, I said, well, since I still don't know what I want to do for a job, I'm going to start exploring the sport of triathlon. You see, in 1984, I had seen this crazy race on TV. At that time, it was on, I think, ABC's Wide World of Sports. They covered this thing called the Hawaii Ironman. And in 1984, this 22-year-old woman, how many of you are 22 or close to? Pretty much the whole room. Many of you are probably not going to do your first Ironman race. I think this is forwarding, but you may see some sneak peeks here. Um, this woman decided she was going to jump into the Hawaii Ironman. An Ironman triathlon consists of 2.4 miles swimming, 112 miles on the bike. And to top it off, 26.2 miles on a run at the end, a marathon at the end of all of that. And it's all done on the big island of Hawaii in the lava fields where the temperatures get close to 100 and humidity is 100%. It's brutal. Most people see something like this. See, Julie Moss, at 22 years old, was winning the race. She was being covered on national TV. She was like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm winning. And she was all excited and everyone was cheering for her. And at the very end, she started to break down. Her legs are wobbling. She's falling to the ground. Those brown stains on her pants are real. Definitely pooped her pants. Happens sometimes. And you know, most people look at that and they're like, oh my god, I would never do that. That is horrible. How could you put your body through that? I watched this on TV and my crazy mind said, awesome. That is so cool. I totally want to push my body to the limit someday. So I remembered that race. It stuck with me after all those years. And I decided to test my feet in triathlon. So I got into the sport. And I was a rookie. I was 24 years old, 23 years old when I started. I didn't know what I was doing, obviously. I looked pretty cool. Um, they put numbers on your body. You kind of like wake up really early. You get a little bit too tan. But you get really fit and really strong. And it's, there's something about the sport of triathlon that is, uh, it is, um, <laughs> It, it's captivating. It really sucks you in. And I knew then, as I started to get into it, and I realized that waiting tables wasn't going to be my career, that uh, triathlon held something for me. So in 1994, I qualified for our, actually 1995, I qualified for our ITU World Championship team as an age grouper. I wasn't a professional, but I had enough talent in the little trifecta game. I had enough genetic talent, and I was working hard and tough enough to qualify. I was 12th out of 12 people, and I got really lucky. That race in November of 1995 brought me a really cool thing. I was sitting on an airplane in Houston that was connecting down to the destination of the race, which was 
Cancun, Mexico for a 23-year-old, getting into the sport. And I was like, all right, cool, I'm going down there to do a race, but I'm also going down there to party and see who else shows up. And while I was sitting on the airplane, I was watching all these other athletes board because it was a connecting flight that a lot of Americans were on. We were all sort of staying at the same hotel. And, um, and I did, for the first time in my life, I've done it since, I employed something that I call willing it to happen. Have you ever willed something to happen? And it did. So in this case, I identified the cutest boy that was walking on. And I said, that one, he will sit next to me. And so I stared him down. And I kept looking at my seat, and no one filled it. And he got closer and closer and closer. And sure enough, he sat next to me. And I looked over at him, and I said, hey, are you going down to the race in Cancun or whatever? What's your name? And he said, yes, I am. I'm going to race there. And yep, my name's Tim, Tim DeBoom. Did you all see my last name? <laughs> yeah. I met a boy. And, uh, Tim was 24, 25 years old and was just getting started in the sport of triathlon. And we fell in love. Complete major hookup in Cancun led to moving in with him one month later, which led to getting married a year after that. I got married at 24 years old, and Tim was already racing professionally. So he, he was a little more talented say, even than I was. He had come out of Iowa cornfields, this kind of homegrown boy, and he just had more talent than you have seen in the sport since. He rose quickly to the top of the ranks. When I sat down next to him, or he sat next to me on that airplane, he'd already been 10th place in that Hawaii Ironman race. 24-year-olds do not get 10th place in the Hawaii Ironman. In endurance sports, peak years are in your late 30s, early 40s even for some people. So that's kind of unheard of. But we enjoyed this wonderful triathlon life. And along the way, I got to watch magic happen. You see, how many of you know someone who's, done, who's been at the top of the world in whatever it is they do? Have any of you known anyone? Who do you know? Awesome. And it's a, it's a cool and really tough thing to watch, and you see the sacrifice that it takes. And that's exactly what it is. It takes a lot of sacrifice to make it to the top level. I happen to live with a man who did make it to the top level in sport, my husband. So along our ride, he ended up becoming the world champion. He won the Hawaii Ironman in 2001, and then he won it again in 2002. This is a photo of him winning in 2001. Those are um, puke marks. See the little brown Coca-Cola that you drink along the way? See that flag in his hand? Um, when you're coming down the finish line, in 2001, it was really cool. The race is always in October. 9-11-2001 had happened five weeks before the Hawaii Ironman. Nobody even knew if the race was going to happen. Airports were just opening up. We didn't know, but we just said, well, let's continue racing because life has to go on and continue training for this thing. So we went out there, and unlike the climate today in the world, in October of 2001, everyone in the world was cheering for the USA because we had been wronged. And to watch him come down the finish line in first place, not only did he win the race, he won the Hawaii Ironman by 15 minutes. That's two and a half miles. Like, he finished, and people were standing around waiting. Like, when's the next guy going to come in? We've already interviewed him three times. It was amazing. But what's really funny, what we find funny, is see that little flag in his hand? Well, because everybody was cheering USA, there were tons of American flags out there on the course. And they actually show footage of him running down this final stretch on Ali'i Drive. And his people are like, take my flag. And he goes by a few. And one of them looks like, the Denny's flag, it's like the size of two cars, you know, and he's like, are you kidding me? He's just, you know, swum, biked, and run a marathon. He's like, no, not that one. I'm exhausted. And the next guy has a pixie stick with a flag on it. He's like, I'll take that one. <laughs> he comes running in. It was awesome. Um, the really funny thing is that I was racing too, and I was 12th place that year. I was the fourth American woman. Um, really great result, but slightly overshadowed which is fine. You know, in most families, 
I might be the stud athlete, but in our family, I'm generally known as sort of the wimp, which is really interesting. But um, what's really funny is that NBC coverage caught us on the course. If you ever go back and Google the 2001, um, check it out on YouTube, 2001 Ironman. Tim's running along. I'm at like mile 10, and he's at like mile 22, right? And we're crossing paths, and he is totally razor focused in the zone. And I'm like, oh my God, he's coming. He is winning by a lot. Still awesome. And I stop and I go, Tim, yes. And he literally is running at me. He doesn't even see me. He just runs right by. <laughs> and they caught it and showed it on NBC coverage that year. And his mom called him. She was like, why did you ignore your wife in the race? He's like, mom, seriously? You were there at the finish. You know, I kind of had a big thing going on. Um, when you win the Hawaii Ironman, you win 100,000. It's a pretty good payday. Takes about eight hours. What is that per hour? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it, it's a it's a huge accomplishment, and he won it two years in a row. And on his third attempt, Tim was actually winning the race, and I was commentating that year because I said I finally learned that I want to see my husband finish and not be out there on the course. And I watched him run by, and he looked kind of yellow and a little bit off. He was in second place at this point. Like something doesn't feel right. I got a call about 10 minutes later, Tim DeBoom's been pulled from the course. He passed a kidney stone on the course. It's insane. Um, he never, honestly, yeah, that's how tough, seriously. And so I say, well, I'm tougher because I had a baby, which we'll talk about later. But then he would argue he's almost as tough because apparently passing a kidney stone is like equal to childbirth or something. Anyway, that's our battles. Um, so I got to watch this amazing and awesome ride, and I was along for the ride, and I was racing too, and I was a great triathlete. I was one of the top American triathletes at that time. Um, and what we did is we just went on and had this wonderful triathlon life. We uh, ate a lot of food, uh, signed men's chests in Black Sharpie, often, all the time. It's always signing men's chests. Um, <laughs> You know, doing photo shoots, but here is a little precursor of what's come. Not looking too cute in my like unisex unitard outfit, right? But I was fast. So, <clears throat> yes. So, uh, so here's where we segue. So what now? So I see what it takes for someone to reach the top level of their sport, of their career. And I know that there's a huge sacrifice that goes into it. And I know that there's this passion and this like single-minded focus. And the only answer is that you will be successful. And that's what you have in your head. And you have that for years and years and years until you make it. And I knew that I had that inside me, but I just didn't quite have it for triathlon. So I knew there would be something else for me down the road. I just wasn't sure what it was until my epiphany run in December of 2003. So my mind was open. You know, I, uh, I was just waiting for an idea to strike. How many of you have an idea right now? You know you're going to do something with it someday. There's a few. That's cool. Um, mine came to me on a training run. This is another thing about sports and fitness is that you, there's a period of time for me, it's a 20-minute mark into every workout. 20 minutes into every workout, that's when my mind frees up. That's when the dust settles. That's when I gain clarity. Working out for me is a place where I can go and have ideas. I can go in and clear the clutter. How many of you relate to that? Do you have that when you work out? It's like you start the workout, you're getting pinged with everything in your life, and then all of a sudden it clears, and that's when the good ideas come. And mine came, like I said, on a training run. In December 2003, I was living in a little mountain town called Lyons, Colorado. It's just outside of Boulder, where I live now. And I'm running down Main Street, running along, and I see my reflection in a storefront window, much like this one. And I had three thoughts that day. The first was, I am totally uninspired. I look like a boy. I'm wearing my husband's clothes. They don't fit me right. I don't feel like myself. Um, and the third thought was, I just want to feel pretty. And so I went home, and I, that, that word pretty became more important as the run went on. 
And I went home and I just started scribbling notes down. And this is my original note sheet. This is how skirt sports started. This silly little sheet with the lips up there in the corner and the random words that I actually cut off because I'm too embarrassed for you guys to even see them. But um, it was women's fitness clothing that you look and feel good wearing. And at the time, the only company out there that had done something like this was Juicy Sweats. Can you read that line? Juicy Sweats took frumpy wear to sexy wear. And I thought, you know, I could do that in women's fitness clothing. Everything's so boring and ugly and it doesn't fit well. And we hadn't even gotten to the whole shrink it and pink it phase where it was like men's lines were just smaller and turned pink. And I thought, you know, I gotta do, I gotta do something with this. It's happening. And it was this feeling inside me and it was just growing. It was like this ripple, of, like a bubbling up to the surface. Someone asked me at dinner tonight, like, what gave you the courage? To, uh, to take this idea and go. And I said, I don't think it was one step where I was standing here one day and then the next day I just went. It was, it was a vague, indescribable process. It was, you have a thought, it sits with you. And maybe it goes away for a while and then maybe it comes back, but one day it never leaves your mind and then it starts to take hold. And then you get obsessed. And then it's all you think about and that's kind of when you know you have to move forward on it. So I moved forward on skirt sports. And uh, in 2000, oh gosh, are these in the wrong order? Hold on a second. I might have missed a slide. Sorry, close your eyes. There we go. All right, I'm going to go back. What I decided to do was I said to Tim, I think I'm going to start a clothing company. And he was like, okay, well, that's great, but that's kind of a big statement. You're going to start a clothing company? Really? How are you going to do that? And I just looked at him, and I was like, well, you're wearing clothes, and I'm wearing clothes, and I see a lot of people out there wearing clothing, so somebody figured out how to start a clothing company. So I'm going to figure out how to start a clothing company. I'm just going to figure it out. And that is another thing that is hard to describe, but you have to have that mentality that you can do it. Bless you. And... Uh, I said, OK, let's break this down. What have I learned as an athlete? said, I'm going to take the aid station approach to business. You can't just go, I'm going to start a clothing company, and in a month, you have a clothing company. You've got to look at it in mile approach. So I said, OK, if you start a marathon and you're looking at mile 26, you're never going to finish. It's too intimidating. You won't get there. So miles one, two, and three. That's how far ahead you can look. So mile one. I was like, I have this idea. It's a feminine line of clothing. I think I want to focus on a skirt. It's this thing that no one's ever done. I mean, tennis players have done it, but runners didn't do it, and triathletes haven't done it. So I was talking to this guy, and I said, how do I get started? He goes, well, don't you think maybe you should make some products and see if they work? And I was like, oh, yeah, that is kind of imp important. Duh. So it's that idea that, even the most basic things sometimes don't hit you until you get a little bit of outside help. And for me, it was really important to seek mentors early on. I had a lot of coffee meetings. Good thing I love coffee. Um, and I picked a lot of brains. Anybody whose business or career touched clothing, I reached out to. It could be entrepreneurs who had their own clothing companies. It could be designers marketing people, it didn't matter, manufacturing. I just picked brains. I picked brains for about six months. So in the meantime, started making some products. In mile two, learn how to start a business. I literally read this book and other books, like How to Start a Business for Dummies. I also went to the Boulder Chamber of Commerce, and I took How to Start a Business cl class for 40 bucks. I mean, there's resources out there that are really basic, and you guys probably won't need that because you're in school here and you have different resources and tools than me, but it, it's not that hard if you can organize your brain and just set yourself a path. So early on, I learned, okay, start a business. Am I going to be an LLC or a, or a sole proprietorship? I, you know, I couldn't even tell you why I made certain decisions now, but I can tell you that at the time, I knew why I made those decisions. So uh, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to take on and a lot to learn. And in my mile three of those first three miles, which stretched for me for about nine months, 
Don't quit your day job, but move forward with reality in mind. A lot of people just start going forward, but it's not realistic yet, or they're not paying attention to the signs. Like early on, I said, well, if doors are opening, then I'm going to go through them. And if I keep getting doors slamming in my face, then I, obviously that's a sign. I kept getting doors that were just swinging wide open, so I just kept going through them. It was amazing. Business plan? My business plan was five pages long of notes. Um, I didn't really know how to make a business plan. I never made a business plan for skirt sports. I don't know if that's a bad thing to say. Is that a bad thing to say? Are you guys all encouraged to make business plans? Um, I did one talk at, at CU, and I said something like that, and like, oh, no one makes business plans anymore anyway. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know, but I didn't make one, so that's how it is. Um, so I wrote about five pages of why I want to do this. I was thinking about my mission. I thought about my core values. Skirt sports core values are my core values. They still are. I mean, that's kind of what it is. You're starting a business based on you. You have to resonate with your own business or you won't make it. And I think you always need to dream and continue to be a visionary, but continue to listen to reality. Those were, those were you know, kind of my, my third part was, OK, I'm learning about business. I've got to start this idea of what would this structure look like? How am I going to get these products to market if they work, et cetera? But in the meantime, I was still racing. Because like I said, don't quit your day job. And in September of 2004, I decided to sign up for the Ironman Wisconsin in Madison. And I wore a prototype. Can you guys see this? It's kind of washed out, isn't it? Can you see that photo? A little bit. It's, um, that is a prototype. Oops, you got cut to the chase there. Um, prototype of what would become one of Skirt Sports' core styles in our line. And what I decided to do was, well, I'm still sponsored by Tier. They don't have to know I'm starting a clothing line. Um, and I'm going to wear a swimsuit most of the day because back then, that's what women had as options, a swimsuit. It's going to be hot out. But I wanted some coverage on my butt because I could win that race. Who knows? Maybe I would win. And when you, when you are in the lead in a race, those cameras are really up close and personal. And I said, I want a little coverage. And I kind of want a little attitude push. And I want to see what I can do. I want to see if this thing performs. Because if it performs in an Ironman, then I know that I'm onto something. So I actually came off the bike in third place. And I put my little called the transition skirt. It was like a race belt, and I had my number on it, a little pocket in the back, a little mesh thing, and actually it was like a loincloth. It, bar had like, it barely covered me, but it was something, and it was the concept. Um, that would never make it into production because factories couldn't actually produce that. It was a little too, uh, I don't know, it was too difficult, too uh, fine-tuned. But I put that thing on in third place. How many of you have been to University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison? Anybody? So you know, it is total party school. It happened to be a football weekend. So the eights, the run is two loops down and around frat row. Um, the fraternities are totally psyched. And they are out there giving you what you hope is Gatorade, but it might be beer, but hopefully it's Gatorade. And, uh, and it's rowdy and fun, lots of energy. And I remember coming around on that first loop. And when you're in the top three, there's uh, lead bikes. And so the lead bikes would be like, all right, here she comes, a third woman. Third woman's coming. They could see the lead bike. And then they'd be like, go third woman. And as I went by, I would hear that. And then as I, as I passed, I would hear this, wait, what was she wearing? Was she wearing a skirt? Whoa, that's kind of crazy or cool. or I don't know what it was. So on the second loop, I had passed all the women ahead of me. And I was winning my first Ironman of my career in this crazy outfit. And as I would come upon these aid stations and the people cheering, they would see the first bike. The like, first woman's coming. Oh my God, here she comes, first woman. And they go, it's the skirt. The skirt's winning. <laughs> sure enough, I won an Ironman. I won the 2004 Ironman Wisconsin wearing a skirt, a prototype of what would later launch my company. And it was crazy. Like, I remember coming down the finish line of the Ironman, and you're, it's really emotional. It's crazy emotional. And I'm running along, and I see one person on the side that I know, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm winning! I'm winning! 
and he goes, that's awesome, now keep going, get there. So I did, and it was, I mean, that feeling of winning a race like that, and all, it's like a perfect storm of awesomeness, you know, wearing a prototype, winning your one and only Ironman, it, it's a one in a million chance. Um, I crossed the line, I recovered, three days later I incorporated Skirt Sports Inc. I said I'm doing it, I know I'm doing it, it works, I'm doing it. Five months after that, we went to market. Skirt Sports hit the market. See, we created a product that had never been done, a running skirt. No one had done this. And we were crazy, that's my friend Holly, that's our basement, we were stacked out of our basement. We uh, literally, nobody knew what the hell this was, but they knew that they needed to have it. <laughs> we brought blow up dolls to expos, seriously. I don't, what were we thinking? I don't know. And we hung them up by the clothing. It was so weird, but I, we were just in it. I don't, we were having so much fun. Um, our first year in business, we did 325,000. I had, I, I offered five styles of skirts, two casual, two performance skirts, and one was that little wrap skirt from my Ironman. And uh, the casual skirts didn't sell for three years, but the performance skirts sold out within three months. I sold about 2,500 skirts, and I was like, oh my God, it's working. Now we gotta make more skirts. And then I went to the factory and said, we need more skirts. And I'm like, okay, that'll be four more months. It's like, what? Then I realized, now I gotta learn business, because I'm onto something. It's a really good problem to have. And nobody's in the market yet, because no other brands had figured out that this thing might work. So we got to live alone in the running skirt category for one full year. Um, I thought I'd put some milestones up here. In 2005, we made our first sale in February at a health club in Austin, Texas. We were doing a photo shoot the day before we launched um, at an expo, and Sandra Bullock was in there. Literally, I walked up to her. I was like, will you please have one of our skirts? She was like, sure, yeah, I'll take one. And she put it on over her clothes. I was like, oh my god, we've made it. Never saw her wear it. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but that was really cool. So we launched e-commerce in April. That was when our website opened. Uh, our first PR hit was in Runner's World in May. We sold out of our skirts four weeks later. That Runner's World article, still to this day, people reference it. That, the power of PR is pretty big. In 2007, we did our first year over a million in sales. Um, by the way, in 2006, four brands got into the category. By 2009, every brand was in the skirt category. So we're fighting competition along the way now, too. Um, in 2010, we were profitable for the first time. So it took, uh, this, that was our sixth year in business, and we were profitable at over 5% EBITDA, which is actually a pretty good uh, benchmark for our industry. And then we steadied. And so from 2012 to last year, we did over 10 million in revenue across three years, sort of stable, flopping around a little bit, and we're gonna get to that in a minute. Those are kind of some milestones. That's like the life of a business, it's like a little excitement, and then you go, wow, now I got a real business, and now we're figuring out how to do it. So we had some challenges along the way. So one of the first things people always ask are, what are your biggest challenges? And I usually gloss over this one because I figure like, well, everybody always has this challenge. But I do think it's important to touch on because it is a challenge. It's a challenge when you're growing, and it's a challenge when you're not profitable. It's not usually a challenge when you're profitable. Then it doesn't matter, everybody will give you loans and all that. But when you need it, it's really hard to get money. Um, personal guarantees, so thanks Tim for winning the Hawaii Ironman. That definitely helped and I think that's a big lesson for entrepreneurs. You are on the hook financially. Most entrepreneurs are. We never went the route of putting all of our savings and, and you know, having a second mortgage on our home and all of that, but we guarantee our loans to this day. So that's kind of a biggie. And there's a lot of pressure, and not a lot of people can handle that. So it's just something that you have to know comes with the territory. Uh, skirts also financed by a bank line, but that's also hard because um, within our category of business, we buy inventory twice a year, huge chunks you know, $500,000 twice a year or more, you know, a million dollars sometimes, it depends on the season. 
and uh, we have to pay our factories before we get the product. And there's this period of time, it's this like one month window where it's on the ocean coming over. You've paid for it, but you haven't booked it, so you can't get loan. It's a really, really kind of, um, it's just a crappy little part of our financing story that every apparel business has or most consumer goods businesses go through where you go, can't you just give us that bridge loan for one month and you just can't get it. So we hit a wall. We hit a wall a couple times. Our first wall was in 2007 and we've done two rounds of friends and family financing. So Tim and I still maintain about 60% of our business, but we have raised over one, we raised 1 1.2 million total with the two rounds. It's, um, I didn't know anything about this and I don't love raising money and I don't want to raise money again. And my goal for my business is that I can choose when I want to raise money again or choose when I want to exit the business and not have it be forced upon me like it was the first two times. So it's another interesting thing. Like if you can't give up control or you don't want to share the wealth, then being an entrepreneur may not be for you or being a fast growing company may not be for you because you're going to have to find ways to get money to make your company grow. Um, Another round of challenges, manufacturing. This is a dirty, dirty part of life in the apparel business. It's not the child labor thing and all that. We don't, we're not big enough to even touch that part of manufacturing. For us, the problem is finding great factories. There's a lot of them, very few in the US. They're almost all overseas. And if they are in the US, the pricing is astronomical and we wouldn't be in business because we would have to sell this pair of capris for 150 bucks and no one would buy them just to make a margin. So we produce offshore. And we have had some things happen where the, for the second time in my life, I had to will something to happen. Um, I'm gonna share a story. This happened in 2009. We had a, a big economic decline in the US, as you all know. And uh, we were producing in Taiwan. And we were working with an agent who we had done one season with. So it's a trust thing. You wire money before your stuff is made, right? But we'd already worked with him for one round. So we thought, OK, this will be fine. It's legit. So we go into our fall season, and, and, and it's going to provide our uh, spring 2010 line. And we wire him a couple hundred thousand, pre, you know, the, the prepayment. And then we don't hear from him for like a week, and then another week. And we're trying to get in touch with him and this little bits of feedback. And, and then there's this sort of um, issue that we realize is happening. And we're like, oh, crap. Something's gone wrong. He's blaming us for something. We can't figure out. Where... We thought our agent was the factory. He was representing himself as the factory. But in fact, he was an agent subcontracting our products to other factories is really kind of a weird thing, right? So I was like, oh my God, we're going to lose 200000 and we're not going to get our product for spring. And when you don't deliver to REI or the big accounts we had, we're going to lose them. And if we lose them, we're done because you don't get another chance to come back. And I remember sitting down with my friend, one of the founders of another great company in Boulder called Golight. Actually, Golight just went bankrupt after all these years. So that's a whole other story. Um, but, but I sat down with them in 2010 and said, what do I do? And she just said, Nicole, you just got to will it to happen. You got to make this thing happen. Do it, whatever it takes. So I called my dad, who's our CFO. He lives in Savannah, Georgia. He's 70. At the time, he was like 66. I go, hey, dad. OK, so there's this stuff going on in Taiwan. We got to go to Taiwan. And he's like, OK, great. So when are we going? I said, tomorrow. He was like, oh, tomorrow. I said, yes, tomorrow jumped a flight, we went overnight, we found our agent, we made him take us to factories, we got a translator, we talked to the factories directly, and we negotiated a deal so that they would produce our products. We made it happen. Like you could sit here at home and lose it all, or you can go over there and make it happen. And when it's all on the line for you, you just gotta do it. There's no other option. And I think that's a big takeaway is there is no alternative but that you will succeed. That is really important mindset for an entrepreneur. All right, part three of challenges. 
attracting and then keeping great people when you have no money, you're paying them way below what they would normally get. You really don't want to give up equity, so you're trying not to do that either. And it's on the promise of future excitement and a great culture, right? We still operate that way. I mean, we pay a little better than we used to, but... So I have a question here. How many employees that were with me in year two do you think are still with me today? Nine years later. How many do you think I still have with me? Anybody want to sh shot? Okay, wait. We have 12 people on board, so that gives you a little background. 12 people. All right, so what do you think? How many? 11. You think 11? Wow, you're so awesome. One. <laughs> One. <laughs> they all went away. I mean, you have startup people, and they're often your friends, and sometimes your family, and you can create lots of problems. You can't pay. They don't have the skill set to rise when you're ready to rise. So one. And she started in the stock room at $24,000 a year. And now she's our president. She makes $90,000. And she is going on maternity leave probably next week. Second person in our company to have a baby. So it's, you can rise with a company, but it takes time. And you, it usually you hurt a lot of relationships along the way because it's kind of the name of the game with startup. Today, so skirt sports today, we're reinventing. So our biggest year in business, we were between four and five million in revenue and we were profitable. The skirt category got saturated down to the level of $20 skirts at Target. Our, our best selling skirt is $68. It is a high-level, premium, high-performance skirt, great fabrics. We've got the quality game going for sure. But even with that message, the market got saturated. Women's Apparel is doing a, a nosedive right now in specialty stores, mainly because there's three huge women's brands out there that you call the verticals that are coming in and just sort of taking everybody. Even though they don't specialize in running, their founders might be a little wacky, um, can you think of the big companies I'm talking about? Uh-huh, that's one of them. Lulu. Would you? Someone else said something. Athleta. Athleta, and then Lucy. And there's a few others, and there's some coming from overseas, Sweaty Betty and Lorna Jane. And, and they're coming in, and they don't sell to stores. They sell direct only. So they have their own stores, and they sell online. So for a brand like us, we're a multi-channel brand. We, uh, we did a big reinvention. Our brand was reinvented. We started out as a very high-performance brand, uh, elite. I won an Ironman in the product. I watched the people who gravitated to skirt sports and our message of inspiration, and it wasn't people like me. It was people who kind of didn't fit in with a lot of other brands, people who felt excluded. So there was something about what we were doing. It was maybe the modesty of a skirt um, that it covers your body, but at the same time, there's like a sexy factor to it. So it kind of had this illusion, um, but it helped women break barriers and get into running who otherwise had no other options. And so today, we are the brand who has embraced that, and not every brand has embraced that. In fact, there are no other women's fitness brands who are speaking this message right now. Instead, you're still seeing images of women doing yoga poses that you can never do or having unrealistic bodies. And, and for us, it's about inclusivity. This is a photo shoot we just did down in Savannah a couple months ago. Women of all shapes and sizes. We're pretty much ageless. 20s to 60s are wearing our product. And it's, it's, it's just something about the fact that it makes you feel good. It's not about being fast. It's not about losing weight. It's about feeling good and feeling comfortable in your own body. And that message feels awesome to me. And so from a business model, we learned that multi-channel brands blow the doors off single-channel brands. We toyed a couple years ago. We were seeing this, like, stagnation. I was like, well, maybe we should just be a direct brand. Look at all these other women's brands that are doing this, and they're successful. And, um, and we started playing around with it. And in fact, we let some of our wholesale business go. Wholesale means selling to stores. That's how we, that's how we define it. And our business shrunk a little bit, um, probably about 20% down from our biggest year ever. But it's maintaining now. And now we're getting back on track. And we realized we don't want to let go of wholesale. 
it's, it's too important to us. There's too many opportunities out there still, but yet we want to have still a big focus on our e-commerce. Our website is huge and it drives a ton of uh, profitability. This is direct sales. It's really cool. And we are a company that invests in our own events. We put on events. We used to put them on around the country, now we've focused. And finally, we may have a potential future opportunity of opening our own, our own brick and mortar stores. We have a boutique in the front of our offices in the middle of nowhere. People shop there every day. So it's kind of like eyes open to the future. You, see, you have a story you're carving out, but we're working on this redefining now, 10 years in. It's crazy. And so that leads me to where am I today? So three years ago, I had a baby. I mean, Tim and I, we were never going to have kids. We were like, why would we do that? Every time someone asked, there'd be a screaming baby with boogers all over. Parents were fighting or not talking to each other. And we'd be like, OK, they break up, they break up marriages. Um, there's a lot of boogers. And people are always sick. And they're just kind of bratty. Why would we want to have that? We love our selfish life. We travel around the world. We do the swim, bike, run thing. Well, at some point, I had stopped racing professionally, and it was like, well, I don't know. What are we going to do, sit on the couch for the rest of our lives? Tim didn't know what he was doing next. He was at the verge of retiring, and we said, we have met some pretty cool kids, so we know they're ki that can exist. <laughs> and we have uh, met some couples who didn't break up, so we could maybe stay together. So um, let's give it a shot. So it was a little more than that, but we, uh, I got pregnant at 39, had a baby, turned 40 a month later. Um, my brain works differently. I'm constantly juggling. I am not as detail-oriented. I, uh, I struggle with keeping things together half the time. All my detail-oriented stuff is based around my daughter. Her name's Wilder. I don't know why we named her that. She is so wild right now. She's like out of control. She just turned three, and she has become a part-time brat, but very cute. And people always say there's a reason kids are cute, or they would be killed. <laughs> so she's awesome, and we're having fun with this. Um, and you know, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I might be running skirt sports for another 10 years that I, ha I never would have thought that. When I started the company, I didn't know what was going to happen, but the first time I took money from people, I said, I've got to exit. So I created in my mind that there would be a finish line, and I would exit, and we would sell the company for $20 million or more. That was like my minimum, right? $20 million or more. That, we'll just do that. And, um, and that hasn't happened. And the company is doing great. We're not uh, on a hockey stick you know, growth trajectory anymore, but at the same time, it's been really fun. I'm still satisfied. Maybe there's some other things I want to do, but right now I'm riding it out. I think the point is that you all sit here, and in the beginning I said, how many of you know what you want to do? I still don't really know what I want to do. I, in fact, I really don't even know what I do at skirt sports anymore. <laughs> but, um, but the future's wide open. And what you can know is that all the experiences that you have sort of gained along the way are going to help you continue to evolve your next step. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening today. Cool. We've got about 10 minutes-ish. What do you think? Does anybody have any questions? Anything you want to touch on? Yeah. OK, so her question was, how important were mentors in your early days? Um, I think they're very important. But I also think that there's some people try too hard to define mentor and create these really structured relationships with an individual mentor. And if you can find someone who can do that for you, great. But a lot of times, we, uh, a friend of mine, Justin, who came to speak with me a few years back, um, he's, he's the founder of Justin's Nut Butters. Right? Do you, have you guys heard of that company? They, went, they have done phenomenally. I mean, he has knocked it out of the park. They've done their first exit. They got their first like, VC money, basically. 
and he always talked about mentors, and he had a little more structured mentorship than I did. He just said, well, to me, the mentors are pretty much the gray beards. It's the old guys. What you want to do is get the gray beards because they got more time on their hands, and they'd be more willing to work with you and spend time with you. Um, I always felt like anybody whose brain I could pick, who I developed a relationship with, who I felt that I could call when I needed them, that's where I landed. So I would say that for me, it turned into more of advisors rather than a structured mentorship. But the number one thing is relationships. Get those people in your Rolodex, check in with them every six months so they don't, it's not out of the blue when you call to really dig in or ask a favor, you know? But I can say that people like me, people who have gone through these processes, we want to give back. So we love helping people. But we don't have a lot of time. So it's kind of like as much as you can do, right? So important, but everybody's got a different process with how they get mentors on board. Anybody else? Okay, so she asked if it's difficult working with my family. Um, my dad is our CFO. My sister is our accounts receivable manager in Chicago. She has four kids, so she's really good at it because she's really mean and yells at all of the um, accounts who haven't paid us. Um, it's a hard job, actually. It has not been. It's actually been amazing. But I do think part of that is because neither of them live near me. If I was in the same office with my family working, I don't think it would work. And did you notice my husband doesn't work at skirt sports? So we can never work together. We know that about ourselves. I think there's couples who can do that, and it's great. And the better you can define what your roles are early on, I think you'll be better off. But um, even when we were racing, my husband couldn't coach me. I would get too sensitive, and you know, it didn't work. So. I think that at the level of a little bit hands-off, it really worked well with me. However, I've heard a lot of horror stories about companies breaking up and good friendships breaking up and people who go into business with a partner or family member. Those can be tough. So I just don't have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, IG? Like your, um, yes. Oh, my gosh. So we've been sued twice. One time was kind of legit. I'm just telling you guys the inside scoop here. <laughs> One time was sort of legit, and they both involve IP and design. Um, the second time is bullshit, and it's ongoing, and it's pissing me off. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about that one first. So there's this whole cottage industry of people who buy trademarks, and then they're like trademark trolls is what they call them. Mike, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but... Um, they, this company bought the trademark Cougar Sport, and they might have like five pairs of men's sweatpants in stock. I don't even know. They don't seem like a legit company, but they kind of, they do exist. And we have a skirt that last year we introduced called the Cougar Skirt. Of course, flirty little short thing for women, right? So they eventually found it. We were selling it through Amazon, Backcountry, a bunch of other accounts, and then they slapped us with a little lawsuit. So we're going to end up having to freaking pay money because we use the name Cougar on a women's skirt from this company that isn't even really legit. So anyway, our lesson on that was we need to research every single name we ever give a product, and pretty much every name is taken in the trademark directory. So it's, it really adds a whole layer. You can't just be fun anymore and have fun with your naming. Um, the second, the first time we got sued, though, that was a little bit of a gray line. And you know, in business, there's this ethics, there's this line of ethics where you, ha you know in your gut when you're like, I might be doing something not quite right, but I'm not sure how else I should be doing it. Um, this was about five years ago. We were working with a manufacturer. And in clothing, we own a ton of trademarks. Skirts, sports, uh, cleavage alley, pocket. We make a pocket in cleavage alley. We, um, we, own, oh, we own skirt sports for events, for clothing. We, we, just, we own a ton. We own like 12 trademarks. And, um, but you can't patent a product like ours. You could patent like a, a zipper or an invention, basically. So we don't own any patents. And even if we did, then we would have to police them and make sure no one was using them or you lose them. So anyway, the other part of, of IP is who owns your designs? So back in the day, I'm working with a factory, and they talked us into using their in-house 
design and development, and we're paying them a fee for that. And I figured, well, we're paying you a fee, so they're ours. What are you going to do? Take them to someone else and sell our products? Just, like, make them for somebody else? Of course not. They're ours. So um, we then left that factory, and that factory, well, th this was the part that was a little gray. Um, our account manager worked for that factory. She said, I'm going to go start my own sourcing business. I'd like you to be my first client. And we said, well, we trust you, and you're where our relationship is, so we're going to go with you. But she continued to work at the factory while she started her company on the side at night. And we were working with her for future on the side at night. And so that's the gray line. She was maybe working, using their computers, using their resources for her future business. So anyway, six months later, our factory found out that she left and that we went with her. And there was a lawsuit, and we ended up having to go to mediation. I learned a lot through it. Um, and it's all about defining who owns your copyrights in the beginning of the process. Because had we defined that, we wouldn't have had to pay anything and wouldn't have had to go through that process. Does that, I don't even know if that makes sense to you guys. But these are like the struggles. That's that whole manufacturing slide of challenges. It's tough. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. So do you like branch out to other countries with your products? Um, good question. We do have international distribution, but only in one country right now, Australia. And it's a, it's a good account. Uh, there's pro we did some Canadian, and we sell to individual stores randomly sometimes. We have an account in Norway that does a ton of business. But we are not um, serious about it yet. There's translation, hang tags, duties all kinds of different costs that go into it. And one of the things we said was there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. We're still really relatively small and unknown in the United States. Let's you know, focus here as much as we can. But it's a whole area that's untapped, for sure. Yeah? Are you a professional athlete? Yeah, I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> We, um, we decided not to. Uh, you know, being like the real women's brand, uh, years ago we did do some sponsorships, but we never had enough money to pay really high-level people. So we would get these B and C level people, and then we'd be, it, was, it just didn't make sense. So we don't, we don't sponsor athletes. I'm sort of our spokesperson still, and we just sort of speak to the real person and, and use inspiration from real people ambassadors instead of trying to go to the high performance level. Yeah. Behind you. They do a little bit, and that can be a problem, too. Like Australia calls us all the time. One of my customers got your thing from REI. Can you tell them not to ship to Australia? There's some things you can't control that well. Um, we do have a number of key accounts. That's what we call them. They're not big box per se, but they do a large volume. And yeah, those online businesses. I, Amazon's kind of a beast, to be honest. You can find our stuff on Amazon cheaper than anywhere else, and we can't really control that. And they claim, well, somebody discounted it one time, so they match their pricing. Did you know that Amazon works that way? Yeah, yeah so it's, it's kind of a, a little bit nasty, but they're a really important partner because they do a lot of volume. So they help us meet our minimums. Yeah. Um, on one of your earlier slides, it mentioned your time was something. Good question. So I've always been a huge proponent of events, being an athlete. We launched at a marathon expo. We, in the past, we launched into events with a eight-city Skirt Chaser 5K series. Because at the time, our brand was about being crazy, running a 5K, and drinking beer and partying with the guys. So the women started first, guys started three minutes later. So we were running those all over the place. We had a mini Skirt Chaser 5K in Salt Lake City with Outdoor Retailer one year. Um, but we have phased that part of our brand. It kind of lost a little momentum with this color runs and themed events. And now we have one big race in Colorado. It's the Skirt Sports 13er. It's our version of the half marathon. It's not half. It's a whole 13. That's why it's a 13er. And uh, we do that in June every year. So we want one really brand-centric event. But events are huge for us. We go to 40 to 50 expos a year around the country. It's, um, it's our version of doing a catalog. I mean, they all have different metrics. But there's more emotional brand connection when you can actually touch people, not in a creepy way. <laughs> uh, in regards to mile three on your 
Yeah. Can you talk more about the balance of not quitting your day job to become a Kickstarter? Let's find it. I had a lot of slides, didn't I? Um, oh, yeah. I think the day job thing, this applies, I think, to, to a lot of uh, different aspects. Like when I was racing triathlon, I was swim coaching. And then I started racing triathlon. I didn't quit swim coaching until I got good enough to break even. My goal in triathlon, if I could break even, I could put off the real world for a while. So it's, it's phased, right? It's a way to limit your risk a little bit. But the flip side is maybe you're not jumping in with both feet right off the bat. So it kind of depends on where you are. Um, most people I know start a business while they're still working in a different business until it starts to take off. And it's really hard to know when that is. It's like, is it financial? Is it momentum? I, it's really hard to know. It's like something you just kind of know in your gut. I quit racing eight months after I launched Skirt Sports. And I remember, because for me, it was really literal. I was running along in the Chicago Triathlon. And I had, now I was doing, doing both jobs. So I had worked the expo. My legs were exhausted and work the expo for two days and then I come out Sunday morning and I'd been second place in that race the previous two years and I'm running along in 12th place and my claim to fame as a triathlete was that I was never out of the money I won money in every race I ever did but in that race money went through 10 and I was like I'm out of the money I'm done I can be done racing now it's not helping me to be 12th place plodding through a triathlon so m mine was sort of symbolic it's like, all right, this is a sign. Move on. Left my shoes in transition and moved on. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. In closing, could you talk a little bit about uh, brand building? Because you invented this category, and then all the big companies jumped in. But you're still successful. Uh, and a lot of the students sometimes think, I can't enter that industry. It's too competitive. How important is it to really build mm -hmm. a unique brand and even allow you to compete in a very busy industry? I think that's the only way to survive is to have a strong brand that connects with whatever your market is. Um, we, launch, we create something new, right? I built a company based around that name. So now today, as we reinvent, what we have noticed is that we have avid brand loyalists. So we put out a call for ambassadors. We had an ambassador program, 20 people. And we're like, OK, you know what? Let's get 10 more. So we put an email out three weeks ago. And we're like, we're going to grow our ambassador program. You want to apply? Please apply. And we got 400 applications in two days. We had to shut it down. And they still are trickling in. We don't even know how they're finding a backdoor entry to get their applications in. And people are like, your brand changed my life. It's this, there is such an emotional connection with what we're doing. And once you figure out what that is and why they're tapping into you, and for us, it's being that real brand fits real bodies. Um, that is the only, bless you, the only reason we're surviving today. One of our huge challenges is overcoming our name. We're skirt sports. Well, the skirt category is decreasing right now because naturally it rose really fast for like eight years. Now it's decreasing a little bit. Skirts are going down. Our name is Skirt. People think of us as a skirt brand. Well, we've got about 50 styles. 20 of them are skirts, but 30 of them aren't. I'm not wearing a skirt today. I have on our Redemption Capri, our Catherine Tank, and one of our sports bras and our socks. So we're more than that. So I think the only way to be able to transcend is to have a strong brand and figure out from your customers, literally ask them why. What is it about our brand that's speaking to you? Because when I started the company, I was 32 years old. I thought 22-year-old women were going to want this product. And guess what happened? Well, first I was wrong for the first time of most days of my life. Um, and in business, you're always wrong. Like, think about ordering inventory. Wouldn't it be perfect if I could order the exact amount of inventory so that on June 30th, when we got our new shipment, every single piece was gone and I ordered perfectly? Never happens ever. You're always wrong. So you're always managing, like, how wrong, how wrong, how right can I be? So I thought 22-year-olds were going to love our stuff. Well, it turns out 42-year-olds loved our product. And I was like, how did that happen? I don't get it. 
And a friend of mine said, well, Nicole, it's obvious. We women like to think of ourselves as 10 years younger than we are. So I thought I was 22, and those 42-year-olds saw me and thought they were me. And in the end, it's an awesome market, because I have a lot more money than you 22-year-olds and sitting in the audience. <laughs> so I, you know, Mike, I think it's the number one key to success. Yep, create a brand, create the culture, and then live it every day. Don't waver. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everyone.